although the subject of magnetism has been of interest to man for a very long time, comparatively little is known today as to the substance of magnetism. We are fairly well equipped now to analyze its processes and to create magnetic phenomena by artificial means. But the actual nature of the magnetic energy itself, like nearly all other basic energies of life, has not yet been solved or analyzed because of certain inevitable limitations of man's faculties and abilities to examine into things essentially not material or physical within the range of sensory perception. The existence of magnetism was known to ancient people. We find quite a discussion of it in Socrates where he describes pieces of metal attaching themselves to each other to form chains. We know that the lodestone, a natural magnet, was given a great deal of thought by Thales of Miletus, later by Plato and Aristotle. And the area called Magnesia, where this lodestone abounded, has contributed at least part of the name by which we now know magnetism. In the early medieval period, considerable research was done, and so frightened were early navigators that certain mountains in distant areas were magnetic, that they caused their ships to be put together by wooden pegs rather than by nails, for fear that magnets might draw the nails out of the wood. Also we know that at Thrace, priests and priestesses of the state religion healed the sick or treated disease by means of magnetic rods. These rods, long and slender, with metallic tips, and possibly a core of metal running through them, probably gave rise to our popular concept of the magic wand, as it is found in the ceremonial arts of the Middle Ages, perpetuated in the conjuring arts of the modern world. The Chinese knew a good deal about magnetic theory. And as the lodestone was familiar to most peoples of the world, the Chinese also had their own particular type of magnetized substance, amber. Amber is not naturally magnetic, but if stroked or rubbed, develops magnetic properties. And today, the simple test used by the Chinese merchants when trying to determine genuine from false amber. It's merely to rub the amber on his sleeve or on a piece of cloth. If it then picks up small bits of paper, it is genuine amber. Thus magnetism representing an invisible drawing power was recognized and among ancient peoples, it was customary to apply nearly all forms of knowledge uh, to the human body in the effort to discover various treatments for those ailments from which mankind forever sickens. The development of magnetic therapy, however, was probably given its greatest advance by Paracelsus of Hohenheim whose career extended into the early parts of the modern chronological period. Paracelsus used magnetized material 
for the creation of talismans, magnetic rings. He also used magnetic rods, much as the early Thracian priests. And he firmly believed that magnets and lodestones had therapeutic value. Of course, in all these early experiments, we are more or less on the horns of a dilemma. Certainly, these medications were used, and the reports about them were favorable. But considering the time and the circumstances, we are always left to wonder how much of the therapy was the result of the magnet and how much was a psychological cure that was strengthened by great faith and further strengthened by the phenomenal power of the lodestone. In any event, people thought they got well. Whereas in some of our modern methods of healing, people do not think that they get well. And the result is that they remain in their previous condition or uh, become worse. As far as the application of magnetic theory uh, beyond the use of magnetized or sanctified objects, beyond this we come into several uh, interesting areas of speculation. Actually, we know that objects of various kinds were blessed or subjected to magic rituals by ancient people. And that the same occurs in the early history of Christianity. Here, particular objects that had been uh, sanctified in one way or another were held to have unusual uh, healing power. I know cases quite recently in which rosaries uh, carried by pilgrims to Rome and blessed by the Pope gained a considerable reputation for therapeutic value. Uh, as we mentioned in an earlier discussion, the touchstones and touch coins of the kings of Europe also developed long and illustrious accounts of uh, remedial effects resulting from faith or from some quality actually bestowed upon the object. We have no method at the present time of clearly determining uh, the possibility of causing objects to be impregnated with some kind of an electric effluvium or force. However, psychometry, which has gained considerable influence in our thinking, particularly in the last 50 years, would seem to indicate that certain energies from the human body are received and accepted by inanimate objects and held by those objects over perhaps an indefinite period of time. This seems to be the only explanation for a wide variety of phenomena that have been described and uh, reported not only among civilized people but among primitive people who would scarcely have had the ingenuity to invent so complete an account merely from um, some passing superficial analysis. Thus we may assume for uh, our moment, for this moment at least, that there is a possibility that some kind of a substance or essence is imparted to objects or belongings which may have some permanent effect. The dog, for example, apparently is able uh, to follow the trail of a person by the peculiarly advanced sense of smell which the dog possesses. Yet it is almost beyond uh, credibility that the dog is guided in the pursuit of a person over miles of territory simply by the sense of smell alone. It seems as though the animal must have certain other instincts by means of which it gains an awareness or is able to pick up some kind of emanation 
beyond that which is within the range of the sensory uh, perception of human beings. Also, the peculiar habit that uh, uh, Thomas Edison noted of dogs howling on the occasion of death would seem to have some bearing upon this. The dog was not of the family of the person who passed on. Merely, the dog was in the locality or vicinity. And immediately on the moment of death, the dog began to howl although it might have been a mile or two away. This caused Edison to begin to suspect that there was some kind of a free energy in space which carried records of events and occurrences, or there were faculties in man capable of picking up uh, various changes and modifications in the magnetic atmosphere. All of these possibilities center around the existence of some force. Uh, some radiation from a person which does have a lingering effect or continuum uh, in the places where that person has been and among the objects that that person has once possessed. Primitive magic largely depends upon the magician securing some object which has belonged to the person to be involved in the magic or witchcraft. This possession forms a link. What kind of a link? The only possible link we can imagine is that some kind of energy uh, is in this material and that this energy is still associated with the person to whom that object once belonged by which uh, by what Paracelsus calls sympathy. This is the same type of thing that is recorded in the case of the amputated leg, which was buried and uh, in a box in the cemetery. In nailing the lid on the box, a nail entered the amputated leg. The person who had lost the leg felt the pain of the nail for several months although he was not near the place where the member had been buried. But when the nail was removed from the little box containing the uh, removed member, the pain in the in invisible leg of the patient ceased, thus seeming to indicate, again, some sympathetic connection between the individual and some part of his own body that had been removed surgically. All of this can only come to one general conclusion, namely that there is some kind of an invisible field of energy, of magnetism, as it was generally called, and that the person uh, could use this energy in various ways to affect his life under certain conditions. Also, as Paracelsus pointed out, that the energy of one person could be communicated temporarily to another person in the form of a sort of invisible blood transfusion, a mysterious process of contributing energy. Energy is life. Energy is the basis of survival. And among the old Orthodox Jewish families of Europe, <coughs> If some loved member of the family reached the gates of death, the other members gathered around the couch of the very ill person, and each one offered some part of, a, of his own life to extend the life of the loved one. There are mysterious reports of the fact that this sacrifice was wonderfully accepted, that the dying person recovered, but that the one who gave him this life at his own length of years correspondingly short. Such energy and mysteries and legends and fables are too common to be completely ignored, yet frankly the average person today does not know what to do with them, cannot put them together into any kind of an immediately rational pattern. Today in our rather materialistic world, scientific men are loath to consider such problems as the medieval concepts of magnetism. 
As we continue, however, to explore primitive medicine, which has become quite a fad these days, and we continue to send expeditions to primitive people to learn their healing methods, it is quite possible that someday we will run across uh, such a body of evidence supporting the idea of magnetic healing that we will be forced to recognize the need for a thorough investigation of the subject. In the meantime, we will try to put together some of the concepts that are now held by minority groups, individuals or small groups who have experimented with this field or have restored as far as they could ancient knowledge bearing upon the subject. If a magnetic element exists, it can be derived from a number of sources. First of all, magnetism uh, may be a free energy in space itself. In other words, the universe has its own magnetic field. These magnetic fields are in certain relationship uh, to the organized development of nature. If the magnetic force exists at all, and the lodestone would seem to leave no doubt, then this force is useful. This force does not exist primarily merely to stimulate uh, the wonder and awe of man. Magnetism, if it is a natural phenomenon, is an essential part of natural order. It has some use some very important reason for existence. And this reason for existence is not exhausted by the localizing of this magnetic energy in lodestone or its stimulation in magnetic iron. If, if this force or substance also has an existence in the world, in the earth, in the solar system, if the sun, as some have suspected, is directly related to the phenomena of magnetism. If the attraction of the moon or the tides of the earth is a magnetic phenomenon, if many of these uh, forces and circumstances which can be observed are traceable to the existence of a magnetic agent, then we must assume beyond any reasonable doubt that magnetism is also a factor in the composition of man himself. Man must use this force which belongs to nature and from nature this force must pass to man to maintain some part of human function in the same way that it must contribute to natural function. The second possible thought in relation to this matter lies in the relationship between magnetism and electricity. We know that the electrical agent also exists. We know that there is a basic difference between electricity and magnetism. Some have suspected that what we call electricity is negative magnetism. In other words, that while we have had the general tendency to think of electricity as a positive agent and magnetism as a negative, it may be the reverse. And we recognize electricity because it is more obvious, whereas magnetism is actually more closely associated with the life and survival factor in the world of which we are a part. Also, we can say that magnetism, if it exists in man, must exist also in other creatures. Uh, the Egyptians were certain that there was a powerful magnetic field around the cat. And both the Egyptians and the Hindus believed the serpent to be peculiarly associated with magnetic force. In fact, among ancient peoples, the serpent was frequently used as a symbol of the magnetic agent itself. If every living thing has a life of its own, it is also very possible that this life has a magnetic factor. The trees are therefore. Uh, endowed with magnetic attributes, that even the elements themselves have magnetic factors involved in their compounds, that chemicals are magnetic to a degree, that in some things magnetism is obvious, in others not obvious. 
but that magnetism may be part of the entire cohesive principle by which matter is brought into the organization we call form. Paracelsus suspected strongly that form itself is a manifestation of magnetic processes, and that the failure of magnetism in holding together certain basic elements of structure results in the decomposition or disintegration of bodies. Magnetism may also be regarded as having a connection with the human will. It is quite possible that man is capable of directing magnetic energy by the power of his own mind. This would be especially true of such magnetic currents as might exist within his own body. The person may therefore be capable of causing energy to move from himself, to reach out towards some other thing, to influence that thing, or to condition it in various ways, or to impart its own life to other forms in nature. Uh, the ancients assumed that this was possible, but they used rods or some physical connection by means of which the magnetism of the operator could be communicated to the subject or patient. The question now remains as to whether such magnetic connection is necessary. In our way of thinking today, it is not. And we are inclined to suspect that magnetic current can be determined or directed entirely by the will or the mind and that energy can be propelled from us or from our own natures into space by intensity of thought, concentration, or meditation. Such thinking, of course, has always existed to some degree among Oriental peoples. Another possible source of magnetism, of course, will be magnetized substances, uh, elements in nature which are peculiarly associated with this uh, element. In the, in the, with this phenomenon. Uh, one interesting thing that I think we should bear in mind is the effect of magnetism on the atmosphere and the atmosphere upon magnetic fields. Uh, this uh, matter was explored some years ago in connection, in connection with earthquakes in Japan where it was found that magnets were demagnetized a few seconds before an earthquake. Uh, this seemingly has other important suggestions for us. Uh, shortly before an earthquake in South America, all the fish in streams and pools suddenly died. Uh, just a matter of minutes almost before the earthquake, they began floating to the surface of the water dead. In another area, cattle uh, that had uh, been grazing in a certain locality suddenly broke into panic and fled the region. And within a very short time thereafter, the entire area of land which they had left broke off and fell into the sea. If they had remained there, they would all have died. As it was, no animal was on the area when it finally fell. Other examples will be the very notable effect of even small and minor earthquake shocks upon the hatching of eggs. A, uh, an earthquake tremor so slight that it would not physically move anything except perhaps slight agitation will immediately kill eggs in an incubator. Uh, yet if you take hold of the corner of the incubator and shake it much more violently it will not injure the eggs at all. There is something communicated directly by the magnetic force of the earthquake. Now various opinions have been advanced as to the cause of such uh, possible magnetic association with earthquakes. One has been that the magnetism is generated as a result of the land motion. In other words, an earthquake occurring over a fault, the motion slowly begins underground with tremendous resistance. And that this very slow but powerful resistance motion may create magnetism, as in the case of the Chinese rubbing the amber on its sleeve. This might be a fairly good answer if we were sure that the earthquake in question arose from this source. But we are not at all certain of that. We are not at all certain that the origin of an earthquake is actually within the ground itself. We are beginning to suspect now that the earthquake itself is a magnetic atmospheric phenomenon. 
and that there is a discharge of static electricity, a discharge which striking a fault causes motion. This could well be true if, as in some instances, uh, we find uh, very strong evidence of magnetic effect or influence at a time when the most delicate instruments that we possess today show no indication whatever of any earth motion. Uh, it was originally held that the motion produced uh, the magnetism. But the magnetic reports of more recent years show that the magnetic disturbance precedes any possible record which we can make of motion of any part of the earth itself. This uh, we also observe in another way in connection with many earthquake reports. And some of you probably have been through some earthquakes and will perhaps be able to bear witness to this. But shortly before an earthquake, most persons uh, suffer from a slight uh, nervous uh, shock or agitation, very often striking the pit of the stomach. The individual feels a moment of nausea or feels a very definite sense of personal disturbance. He feels as though something is happening that he doesn't know about. It, it worries him. It becomes a definite sense of illness without any actual sickness necessarily following. And a few seconds after this rather peculiar nervous tension, the earthquake may be felt. But the research on earthquakes has already proved conclusively uh, that there is a magnetic factor. And that this magnetic factor almost inevitably precedes the shock, sometimes by only a few seconds, sometimes by several minutes. This, because we are able to, to classify it to some degree, and to notice its effect, for example, on the hatching of eggs and things of that nature, must cause us to realize that there is an energy or a substance moving in the atmosphere, which can have a direct and immediate effect upon life itself, as in the case of the eggs, or can cause concern, agitation, and panic among animals that certainly will not react to any ordinary psychological stress such as man knows. But these uh, warnings or these magnetic disturbances affect temperament, affect the individual. We often hear the term earthquake weather, a peculiar stillness, a peculiar suspension of energy. We are beginning to take more interest in this type of problem since the development of the atomic bomb and the various developments therefrom because we are now experiencing the possibility that disturbances of the atmosphere enveloping the planet may very directly affect all life on the planet and can, if uh, sufficiently pronounced, endanger the life of creatures inhabiting a planet. In some way, therefore, the invisible world around us begins to move in upon us. And while we cannot see it, or we cannot entirely estimate it, we have some recognition of its value or of its importance. Human beings, uh, like all other creatures in nature, also have certain eccentric manifestations with which we associate them. There may be a thousand persons attend a conservatory of music. Perhaps a half dozen of these will become leading musicians. The others will become at best only satisfactory, and some will uh, never be able to develop any uh, advanced musical appreciation or technique. The same is true in sciences and arts. And nature is continually producing exceptional individuals in various fields of activity. The history of the healing arts from the most remote times indicates that this is true and that there have been persons at various times in history who seemingly have possessed extraordinary healing powers of their own. 
these individuals are capable of causing the sick to be improved uh, by proximity to the healer or by methods of the transference of some invisible or certainly intangible effluvium, which seemingly uh, has the same effect as an advanced medication. The use of electrotherapy, the use of electricity and magnetic factors in the diagnosing of disease, uh, such ex examples have already become reasonably familiar. We know today that we are able to gain a far greater knowledge of the more subtle elements diagnosed through the use of electrical equipment. All of these steps of progress bring us closer and closer to the core of our subject. And this core seems to indicate that there is the possibility of the development of a therapy, of a method of healing resulting from a growing and uh, improving knowledge of the magnetic fields or energy fields of the human body. If we go back to the beginning of the theory of medicine, well, we come upon a very simple basic concept. Namely, that it was the intention of nature that man should be well. If the human being, like all creatures in nature, is supposed to have a reasonable span of health, this span of health is uh, presumed to extend uh, from the beginning of life to such a period as the functions of the body, exhausted by natural fatigue and age, uh, will simply cease to continue to function. Nature, however, did not intend individuals to be invalided throughout their lives, to suffer from innumerable aches and pains and to be half dead long before the appointed time for their departure. This continuous uh, record of illness, infirmity, disease, and some, to some degree even accident, all of this together imp implies some ignorance, some misunderstanding, some disobedience in man, by means of which his natural allotment of health is impaired or actually destroy. Nature's processes for keeping things healthy is to impose upon them an adequate system of circulation and ventilation. Nature is so balanced that if its processes are permitted to develop and function normally, that nature is continuously healing itself. The world will heal itself of any and all natural ailments that may develop within it. It has the mysterious power of restoring. It has the power of purifying its own atmosphere, of purifying its own water, and of gradually replenishing its own soil. The earth, if not abused, and its natural processes unbalanced by some interference, will move along in a comparatively healthful manner, maintaining the life upon it in a reasonable state of well-being. It is largely, therefore, man's unbalancing of the laws governing natural processes, man thrusting upon nature too rapidly, an excess of problems for which nature cannot provide immediate solution. And the same thing happens within the individual. Nature intended this body to be a self-remedying structure within a reasonable degree of function. It expected that the body would recuperate from its own depletion, that it would restore and repair uh, such common damage as might naturally come to it. And it is only when man's way of life or the circumstances of his living confront him with an excess of danger that the recuperative power of nature is inadequate. So the purpose of nature's construction in the beginning 
was that all things should have the remedy for their ills within themselves. And what we know as therapy in general arose from man's artificial <coughs> attitudes toward life and the fact that through neglect or through ignorance or excess, the individual passed beyond the condition in which his own structure could remedy its defects. Nearly always this condition is reached through intemperance or through the breaking of the common rules of health uh, which nature has given us uh, to understand by way of the intuitive and instinctual faculties of our own consciousness. Those false or exaggerated conditions which cause man to become ill and which prevent nature from being able to meet the challenge of the energies needed to recovery. These are for the most part, for the most part, depletion and obstruction. Depletion is the exhaustion of resource and obstruction is some circumstance arising which prevents the natural flow of energy through the body. The moment the flow of energy to a part of the body is restricted, particularly by some serious obstruction, the area not uh, permitted to enjoy proper circulation begins to decline. And in the case of the human body, infection set in. And if the condition is not remedied, the individual will die. Obstructions, wherever they occur, challenge means to remove obstruction. Depletion, wherever it exists, challenges us to find methods of replenishment. Actually, sickness is not nearly uh, as physical as we have been inclined to think that it is. Nearly all sickness arises from the failure of energies to maintain the normal function of structures and organizations in the body. Thus, the restoration of energy, the redirecting of it, and if necessary, the temporary exhilaration of it, so that it may break through some block or obstacle. Such processes would constitute a normal approach to therapy. Up to the present time, however, we have not assumed that these energies could be directly communicated. Thus we make use of various secondary means, nutrition, particularly under the vitamin mineral theory, is intended to assist us to get the use of nutritional factors more rapidly for the increase of energy, for the maintenance of vitality. And this has developed largely due to the um, adulteration of the foods which normally should provide energy. And there is still a moot question as to whether artificial energy uh, through medication can be regarded as an adequate substitute for natural nutrition. We know that food grown on exhausted soil, soil impoverished of minerals, and probably impoverished of energy, cannot supply to us that energy which it does not possess. Through the adulteration and over-refinement of food, we also find a diminishing of vital nutritional content, sometimes practically the total loss thereof. So that while the food may apparently nourish the body, it fails to sustain the magnetic fields which are important to the total function of man. Now Paracelsus was of the opinion that the primary function of minerals in the body is to hold and direct magnetism. Therefore that what we take into the body in the form of minute amounts of mineral and metal these form the magnets by means of which energy is drawn from uh, free space and is held 
Therefore, the depletion of certain poles in the human body make it difficult, makes it difficult for man to hold on to or attract energy. Uh, the uh, old uh, parallel of the radio is again as good perhaps as we can use. The radio program is somewhere in free air. The individual has a radio set to be used for the reception of this program. What happens? If this radio set is inadequate, out of order, or out of attunement, the radio reception is imperfect and inadequate. As a result, uh, the uh, program, though it exists in space, just as neat and perfect as ever, simply cannot be recorded in the inadequate or broken instrument. In the same way, although the energy necessary to nutrition is everywhere, it cannot be held unless uh, the instrument to receive it is capable of tuning it in and capable of holding and distributing it. We have long held that most nutrition originates finally in solar energy, and that therefore what we call vitality is conditioned sun energy. We are now suspicious, however, that the problem is a little larger, that not only the sun, but many other parts of space and many other rays and energy fields uh, affect man, pouring in upon him uh, in a variety of ways so that he is actually swimming continuously in a sea of complex energy. Man, however, does not need to worry about drowning in this ocean any more than the individual with a proper radio set need to fear that a hundred programs will deluge him at once. He has the proper means of tuning in what he needs. Those forms of energy which he cannot consciously use may still serve him through the unconscious functions of certain parts of his body. Other energies not for him and not suitable to his kind of life but necessary to some other form of life simply make no record in his nature but go on to fulfill their original purposes. Thus man, by creating polarities within his own nature, is constantly attracting to himself that energy which he needs for life. If he is unable to so attract this energy, then he is depleted, devitalized, or unable to function. Devitalization through exhaustion, depletion, also has a tendency to cause obstruction. Obstruction may simply result from the gradual loss of activity in an area. When this activity is reduced below a certain level, it gradually results in the setting in of a crystallized state. And in this crystallized state, obstruction in the form of crystallization uh, begins to prevent the proper flow of such energy as is available. By degrees, therefore, the body becomes crystallized. It no longer serves as the immediate channel for energy. It no longer distributes energy properly through nervous and arterial venous circulation. It no longer is sustained adequately by the energy which can reach it, or the struggle of the function is not equal to the opposition of circumstances, and gradually the body sickens. Thus the uh, therapy, as Paracelsus pointed it out, in your field of energy, lies in reaching behind uh, the physical situation as it exists, and to discover means whereby the available energies can be brought into direct <coughs> relationship with those structures which need them for survival. Paracelsus also held a series of other uh, thoughts, one or two of which I think might be timely at this moment. The first is we have always held the attitude that in magnetic healing, the energy from the healer moving to the patient resulted gradually in a depletion of energy in the healer. This has been uh, observed, and I think there is no question, but that the constant association with the sick has proved to be exhausting, not only to the magnetic healer, but to the physician in general. 
The sick, in other words, have a tendency to vampirize the well, uh, to live upon such energies as they can find, not necessarily by any intention to do so, but for the reason that sickness becomes a negative situation, a low-pressure area into which energy flows. Uh, this can also occur through very long and close association between the young and the aged. The older person struggling for survival may uh, unconsciously or unintentionally draw energy from the young in whom this energy appears to be superabundant. And it would appear that such as they lose might never even be missed. But the, uh, the tendency to borrow energy, to take it on from whatever source it can be gathered from, has also been generally observed. Um, the magnetic healer of the 18th century and even earlier tried to direct energy by means of the mind. He used his own will as a method or an instrument to impel energy. He came to the conclusion that by determination or by visualization, he could cause the energy in his own body uh, to move from that body into some area or location in the body of the patient. Thus he would will his own energy uh, to turn and become a curative agent in the structure of someone else. He might add to this willing uh, the definite action of attempting to create a polarization with the patient as in the religious form of healing by the laying on of hands or by some direct contact such as placing his hand a very short distance over the affected area of the patient's body and visualizing the motion of energy from his own body into that of the patient. There has been enough evidence to indicate that man can direct and control the flow of energy within his own body. He can cause it to become intensified in a hand or a foot. He can cause it to intensify the functions of a sensory perception. In other words, he can stimulate the power of hearing temporarily. He can stimulate the power of sight temporarily beyond its normal function by the intense application of mental effort. He can also uh, cause energy to move throughout the body to break down various obstructions. Uh, and to reduce swelling or to restore nerve function that has been lost by some accident or illness. Thus, by the power of mind over matter, by the exact and definite en energy of the mind, the individual is able to force energy to break through various barriers and reestablish a degree of circulation or normal function. This would lead then to the possibility of this emanation actually extending from man. And we have this in the researches of Rickenbach and many others. Photographs have been made of the natural flow of energy from the extremities of the human body. Uh, the magnetic field of the human body brought under a great deal of exaggeration through high frequency electrical uh, means has been photographed. And it has been shown that the human body channels uh, electricity, electricity and static energy along certain definite structure. If therefore, for example, you should throw a great deal of high voltage into the human body, which will not injure it and will not cause any discomfort, and then under the power of this voltage itself, you photograph it, you will discover that it its motion from the surface of the body particularly uh, follows very closely the extremities. That, for example, this energy is particularly abundant, streaming from the ends of the fingers or from the palm of the hand. But it will not be so abundant, streaming from some part of the torso or trunk of the body. The energy has a tendency, therefore, to move along the circulation system and to escape from the body in the hands or feet, or sometimes in the head. 
Also, in normal conditions, without this exaggeration, it has been possible to photograph the haze of energy which does surround the body in what has commonly been called an aura or a halo, as in the case of the Kilner screens, which have made this magnetic field comparatively visible. It would then naturally also follow from experimentation with plants and with human beings that this energy uh, can jump a small distance without any apparent difficulty at all. And if a person places his hand two or three inches from the body of another person, the energy from the hand can definitely move into the body of that person unless it meets some magnetic resistance to prevent this from occurring. Also, it has been noted uh, by magnetists working with the sick that various ailments arising in the body of man create their own magnetic fields. Therefore, a very sensitive magnetist with eyes closed, running his hand over an area of the body, say one to two inches from the surface of the skin, can feel as he approaches an area in which an infection or some form of obstruction exists. He suddenly experiences one of two things, either a sudden increase of warmth or a sudden increase of coldness. It is sufficient for him to immediately sense, although he has not touched the area. Apparently the coldness is most likely to be present where function has been obstructed or a process of disintegration has set in. The sense of heat, where there is swelling or congestion, and this is perhaps a little more remarkable inasmuch as the area involved may be well within the structure of the body, several inches from the surface, yet the magnetist can still immediately feed it. Dr. Kilner of Liverpool pointed out also that by means of the magnetic field shown by his screen, it was perfectly possible and entirely practical uh, to diagnose the early stages of pregnancy. He was able to discover pregnancy far before any other test known was able to distinguish it, simply because of the immediate change in the direction of magnetic currents in the body. But this entire field of body magnetism should therefore be neglected is uh, perhaps a serious loss to those who are still struggling to attain health under the pressures and problems of our time. Magnetism, however, we also realize has other values or factors involved. And that regardless of all other equations, magnetism is affected by the mind, by the emotions, can be controlled by them, or can be very seriously injured by them. It is very possible, therefore, <coughs> that what we call the magnetic field is essentially the link between the psyche and the body and the source of a very large amount of psychosomatic phenomena. There must be a bridge by which mind and matter are brought together. There must be a reason why the moods of the mind will affect the chemistry of the body. We know that the effect exists. We are not sure, however, of the bridges by means of which this effect is produced. It is all right to refer to the fact that our thoughts affect our bodies, but how? Certainly these thoughts uh, do not sufficiently and immediately disturb function uh, to uh, explain the, situation that, the situations that arise. Researchers with Kilner screens and with other elaborate electrical devices, including the polygraph used in criminal investigation, all these have proven conclusively that there is a psychic sympathy between mental, emotional function and body function, and that this psychic sympathy uh, has a series of obvious poles of relationship and other poles that are not obvious. One of the most obvious, for example, is respiration. Another very obvious pole 
is the effect of the mental and psychic stress upon the sweat glands. And another interesting and important link is the effect of mental and emotional uh, intensity upon the uh, cardiac rhythm, the action of the heart. It is, we know now, perfectly possible for a person to die of a broken heart. And that a sufficient amount of psychic intensity will damage the heart structure. But how does this occur? We cannot assume that within the structure of physiology as we know it today, that we have a rational explanation of why certain emotional attitudes should ultimately result in bodily toxicity. We must assume, therefore, that as the body is maintained by energy, and that this energy is variously differentiated, we must assume that in some way our attitudes affect the availability of energy and that psychosomatically the various attitudes of man are associated with their symbolical equivalence in the body. That therefore the thoughts of man are certainly associated with the brain. The emotions of man are certainly associated with the heart system. Various attitudes, hate, fear, greed, all of these differentiated emotional mental processes affect various degrees and qualities of energy. Each one of them interferes with the function of some conditioned energy or causes to arise a corruption within energy itself. This corruption, like the pollution of a water supply, in turn will poison the physical structure depending upon this corrupted energy for its own survival. Thus, mental emotional attitudes unbalance the energy supply of structure. And this energy supply is so differentiated psychosomatically uh, that each emotion or each attitude will result in damage to a sympathetic correspondent structure in the body. That it is not just simply a bad attitude making the whole body sick. It is a certain kind of a bad attitude affecting the nutritional energy of a certain part of the body to which it is symbolically or psychically associated by sympathy or similarity. This goes back to your old Pythagorean theory, but it has never been disproved, although it has been ignored for a long time. It would then appear possible to assume that energy responsive to the psychic attitudes of the person can also be exhilarated, can be made better, that energy can be supported by the psyche. Well, the psyche itself is also a kind of energy. And it is one kind of energy working upon another kind. And in through this entire operation of various levels of energy, there appears to be the continual and progressive structure of a law of octaves. In other words, as in music, as in elements, we have octaves of sympathetic patterns. We have harmonic and anharmonic intervals in music. In the same it is variously polluted before it reaches the body. Therefore, it comes to the body depressed and debilitated by the fields through which it passes. And if we have extreme psychic stress or is exceeding emotional or mental tension, a large part of this energy, energy may be drained off before it reaches the body, with the result that we have a physical fatigue arising from psychic stress. If the energy is unable to get through at all, or very little of it gets through, then we have physical exhaustion. As a result of the dissipation of this energy in negative thoughts and emotions. If we are therefore concerned with health problems, we have this to consider. 
We also realize that, as in the Indian philosophies and in Zen and in a great many other rather deep systems which have been developed through the ages, among the American Indian medicine priests, this point was also rather clearly uh, given to us, that actually the focusing of energy in the medicine priest or in the uh, meditating mystic or in the Zen monk, that this focusing of energy and the directing of this energy does not result in exhaustion. Uh, the exhaustion arises from the fact that the individual is pushing from his own energy supply alone. If he is pushing with that part of energy which is already locked in him, the supply is limited. But if instead of pushing he relaxes and permits universal energy to move through him, the supply is limitless. And he is no, in no danger of psychic fatigue as a result of the process. Opens himself and permits energy to move unobstructed through his own nature. He finds that a torrent of universal life can flow through him. And yet he will not be exhausted because he is not working with his own limited supply. If he is able to be quiet, if he is able to be still, if he is able to relax, he forms his best relationship with energy. He releases gradually the obstructions in the body also, because tension is the beginning of obstruction in the majority of instances. Tension depresses function. Tension injures digestion, assimilation, and excretion. And where these are interfered with, trouble is almost certain to follow. The majority of individuals begin to die first in the intestinal tract and then it spreads. The same thing means that the individual in trouble nearly always has to center his attention upon the freeing of the body from the tension that prevents proper elimination of waste. If he is able to clear this area, nature will probably be able to take care of the rest. It is to prevent the building up of poison. Tension builds up poison. Tension can be trouble with others or it can simply be trouble with ourselves. It can frequently also be merely involvement. That kind of twisting, turning, involved, knotted, snarled type of mind, which is unable to simplify its own process and has never been able to arrive at the simple fact that two and two makes four without an argument. This kind of mind wastes its own energy and locks itself against the very life which it needs for proper function. Thus negative habits of emotion and thought do interfere with the distribution of energy through the magnetic field. We have often been uh, asked about things like blood transfusions and infusions and things of this nature as to uh, how legitimate they are and what they actually mean. It is the sworn duty of the son of Asclepius to preserve life if he can. Therefore, in many instances, there are probabilities that infusion or transfusion may be valuable. It is again a battle of energies. But the energy in the blood, which is used for transfusion, is separated from its source of life. Therefore, it must come under the magnetic field of the individual into whose body it is introduced. There is a little battle here, and gradually the living organism takes control and imposes its own magnetic field upon uh, the uh, material brought in by transfusion. Uh, in the interval, however, there has been known to be a certain minor degree of psychic phenomena in which there is an appearance or a suggestion that the introduction of the farm blood causes a moment of mental confusion, sometimes almost a sense of sympathy with the person from whom the blood was taken. This passes very quickly, however, because the dynamic vital center of the body receiving the blood takes over and its magnetism gradually overwhelms the negative or opposing magnetism of the infused blood. Thus the individual takes over again and carries on his own existence. 
But the blood certainly does carry within it one kind of this magnetic agent, which is present in many forms and in many levels and degrees in the complicated structure of man. This all points then to the one situation that we're coming around to, and that is the systems or means by which a magnetism can be used and to a measure is being used in modern therapy. A very great part of biochemistry is closer to the magnetic theory than we realize, inasmuch as biochemistry functions upon a principle that can be reconciled with the idea of the magnetic poles of chemical elements and nutritional elements. If we recognize that every time we take a certain form of nutrition into the body, we are setting up a magnetic field, we then realize, as it has been known for a long time ago, that man does not live actually upon the physical food that he takes in. He lives upon the magnetic fields which are generated in himself by this food. He lives because certain types of magnetism are increased by the introduction of certain foods into the body. These foods become magnets, and the food elements and the chemical elements which they contain and the nutritional elements become centers which draw energy from space. Therefore, nutrition is actually the setting up of a system by which the proper energy can be drawn from space to nourish the individual. To develop this science, then, is really a form of space feeding. And in time, we shall probably derive most of our nutrition from space. It is only a matter of time when our present sources of nutrition will be inadequate. We are worried considerably concerning the uh, gradual depletion of soil. We're using all kinds of synthetic and artificial means to restore uh, the fertility and the richness of soil. But these artificial methods result finally in the food that we eat being simply synthetic, in which we have lost certain basic chemical factors. For example, you have, for instance, two types of a material that can be given to you in medication or nutrition. One is a genuine, naturally produced form. The other is a synthetically produced form, resulting from a careful analysis of the original and the complete reproduction of it uh, by artificial means in chemistry in the laboratory. And working with the synthetics and with the genuine material, it is already not too soon to point out that the synthetics cannot be adequately regulated. The synthetic material contains every known element of the original, yet the synthetic material does not, in most cases, cause an identical reaction. The synthetic has something different. And as one biochemist who has worked for one of the largest pharmaceutical houses in the United States told me, he said, in the synthetic, there is always something different. And that thing which is different is nearly always in terms of something missing. There is something that cannot be reproduced. Some intangible that cannot be added. And uh, the theory of magnetism would assume that the thing that is missing is the magnetic pole. That man cannot artificially create this magnetic nucleus, which is behind every substance that exists. Now, science has been able to reproduce certain forms of this nucleus. But when it reaches a certain degree of complexity, they have failed to carry on. The moment we reach a degree of chemistry in which we transcend elemental processes and go on to the more highly advanced 
we suddenly recognize our own ignorance, our inability to add all of the factors or elements necessary to make the thing operate. Something is always missing. And this something that is missing in synthesis uh, cannot be therefore contributed to the soil, to the earth, to the air, uh, to the body of man. A man gradually will come into difficulty due to the starvation of certain essential areas of his magnetic field. Now, when an individual gets into a state of malnutrition physically, he generally strikes out desperately for food. And the same occurs when his magnetic field becomes deranged. He must replenish it in some way. He strikes out to find the necessary media. And out of this, as it becomes a more generally accepted experience, must come the uh, restoration of a study of pure magnetism, the restoration of man's recognition that he is dealing with an abstract and an intangible, but something exceedingly real and necessary to him. The depletion of the body and its magnetic pole brings man again into the presence of his religious experience. He finds himself, for example, perhaps, locked in a very bad situation relating to health. He is locked, probably, at least to a measure by habit mechanism. He is locked by a complex which he is unable to escape. Now, this complex may not be any different from what it appears to be in the lives of other people. But certain persons react in one way and certain in another way. And in any particular instance, a complex situation, mental or emotional, can produce extraordinary physical complications. Thus, the person, locked psychically, locked magnetically, begins to reveal the uh, physical symptoms of psychosomatic ailments, similar to the causes which are operating in his own life. We might wish to assume that these causes do not operate, but they do. And uh, we may be the best intentioned individuals in the world. We're trying so desperately hard to be wonderful about everything. But at the same time, with all our wonderfulness, we are still pretty nasty about some things. And we have a long time getting over it. We may be so sincere and devout that it looks as though we're just about ready for heaven. But we've never been able to control a gossiping tongue. We've never been free from prejudice. We still flare into jealousy. And we're fine until something goes wrong, and then we're not fine anymore. We simply cannot control these things. And because we cannot control them, we are always punishing the magnetic background of our physical existence. If, therefore, through a religious experience, through a tremendous sense of spiritual exaltation, we are able to send a flash of consciousness, like Bainey's mystical lightning bolt, through our entire psychic life, shattering these negative thoughts, suddenly making a grand acceptance of faith over fear, suddenly resolve with everything that we have to determine a better way of life and live it. And sustained by a tremendous devotion, we may achieve a considerable part of it. In so doing, we may also gain a very rapid recovery from some physical ailment that has beset us. And various shrines of healing all bear witness to the tremendous power of deep personal conviction as a means of altering the magnetic field. One other way in which the field is nearly always better is by relaxation through contemplation. The individual who is able to let go, who is able to discover a certain mystical identity, who is able to be quiet for a few moments, relax in his own psychic life, and, in, and indirectly but inevitably relaxing his own physical structure at the same time, 
will, to the degree that he relaxes, open the channels of energy throughout his body. Thus, in the complete relaxation, he comes the nearest to the complete element of proper function. The individual is most likely to function adequately in a state of relaxation. This does not necessarily mean that he will be most physically active. That is not the problem. It means, however, that the body and all of its structures will be most adequately nourished. And when the time for action comes, he will have the natural reserve of energy for action that nature intended him to have. He will not be forced to act from depletion, which is the case in so many uh, modern individuals. Thus, by relaxation away from tension, emotional, physical, and mental, he accomplishes uh, the adjustment of the magnetic field. And you will perceive in the magnetic experiment that the directions of these currents change, that the intensities of their vibrations change, <laughs> that they also have a certain chromatic scale, and this likewise changes. And uh, there have yet to be a number of experiments showing the relationship between magnetism and sound and that it is perfectly possible to hear the changes of magnetic energy by means of delicately constructed instruments. You can hear sickness and health. You can actually listen to the remonstrances of a peptic ulcer. You can listen to the aggravation of an overtaxed liver. You can also listen to that music of the sphere by means of which there comes a healing to all these diseased and injured parts of ourselves. We will ultimately discover that every vibratory instrument that we know can be used to create a sympathetic reaction to the magnetic field. And that magnetism being the most intimately associated with vibration, that vibration becomes the means of influence. And by changing its own vibratory pole, we are able to change its effects upon our bodies and our lives. Here is another possible field of therapy for our consideration. Another type of therapy that is gradually developing along uh, magnetic lines to at least a, a, a partial degree is the study of psychosomatic dream patterns. Uh, we will ultimately find that there is a strong relationship between magnetism and dream form. Magnetism is the subtle stuff that dreams are made of. Magnetism is the material of so volatile a substance that it can be instantly molded and shaped. Let us, in order for a dream to be perceived, even by a partially awake inner faculties of vision. It must have some organic structure in consciousness. For example, we know that certain types of dreams can be associated with physical distress. We know that the person with indigestion may have a certain type of dream. We know the body which has been adversely affected by narcotics will be subject to certain hallucinations. Also, we are fully aware of the delirium tremens that accompany uh, advanced alcoholism. The various narcotic drugs will produce illusions and delusions. Toxin will produce illusion and delusion. And there seems to be every reason to believe that your magnetic field is the secret of these phantoms which arise as a result of man's mental and emotional energies forming symbols in the magnetic field. If we are able to carry this further, we shall then see why dreams can be diagnostic and prognostic. We realize how they can reflect or interpret man's mental and emotional existence and how they can tell of secrets most deeply locked within himself. All this is possible because the dream 
represents like the strange snowflake pictures created by frost on glass. They represent energy moving within the magnetic field of the individual. Now this energy crystallizes along forms which we call dream patterns. And they have meaning. But the reason they have meaning is because thought and emotion have moved energy. And this energy held in certain suspension has a definite effect upon our lives. Well, energy within man, magnetism within the human body, uh, breaks into at least two distinct forms about which we have not too much information, but a little that may stimulate further thought. Um, magnetic energy either moves or radiate. Therefore, we have forms of magnetic energy which are in constant motion. Uh, by this motion, we mean that the vibratory units are not only vibrating, but they are moving in relationship to each other, like water falling in drops over itself. Then there is another form of magnetism which appears more like a diffuse cloud in which the vibration of the basic unit constitutes the only motion. This type of magnetism does not flow. It ideates. It is a permeating material that sort of drenches things in itself. It becomes a kind of invisible or intangible atmosphere. It can be taken in with breath, which sort of like a cloud or a fog envelops things. This type of energy is comparatively stationary in the body. Paracelsus describes this type of magnetic field as the kind which can be cut with a sharp instrument. And it is because of the danger to this etheric magnetism that when a wound heals, the scar remains, because the scar is in the magnetic field, and that will not get well. It can be covered by plastic surgery, but if it is uh, so concealed, any instrument or person capable of measuring the energy field will still see the scar. It's only its visible uh, part has been obstructed, but beneath the corrected or Beneath the area of the plastic surgery, uh, the original scar is still visible. Thus, this form of the energy remains constant. And this type of constant energy is associated with the most elementary functions of the body. This energy carries with it the maintenance of cell life, the maintenance of the essential unit structure of things. Everything that exists has a core of continuing existence and then a series, a series of moving emanational factors. It has a nature of itself and then it has a function from itself. And these two forms of magnetism nourish these two essential parts of, of structure. That which uh, nourishes the form of things is this cloud life. That which nervous, uh, nourishes function is the motion or streaming life manifestation of magnetism. And this streaming form of magnetism is in constant motion, flowing in through the polarized extremities of mass, creating also within the magnetic field a system of circulation which is very, very important to man. The human being not only has to cast off physical waste, but has to cast off psychic waste. And in getting rid of the psychic waste, uh, we have to depend upon the circulation in the magnetic structure. As this structure corresponds to the magnet, it has poles. And as these poles 
correspond very closely to the magnetic poles of the Earth. The structure of man's magnetic field is very similar to the Earth and its uses are the same. We will finally realize that the poles of the Earth, bound into the magnetic processes of the planet, are the basis of the processes of digestion, assimilation, and excretion for the planet itself. It is because of these poles that refuse matter cast off from the planet is finally returned to free space. And also through these poles, the magnetic energies from outside of a planetary field, in this case from the solar field, must return into uh, the planetary magnetic body. So that in this case, the magnetic field functions somewhat like a pair of lungs. It has a double duty. First, to draw in air and circulate it through the body. Then to gather up waste and exhale it out again. In the magnetic field, uh, the energy of the universe is drawn in through the positive pole of the magnet. And the uh, energy wasted, torn down, broken down, the refuse of function. These elements are cast out through the negative pole of the magnetic field, returning again to space, which becomes like the vast ocean, the purifier of all the streams that flow into it. The same occurs with the magnetic field of the individual. This field draws in its own magnetic nutrition, for while the body helps to set up poles for magnetism, the magnetic body, like the physical, has its own sphere of nutrition, must depend upon this sphere, and must in turn contribute something from this sphere to the maintenance of the material body appended to it. It's the same problem exactly as man's mental and emotional life. These forms of life do not depend upon the body. Yet man's mental and emotional life will affect the body. And the body is unable to resist the effects of those structures which are superior to itself, and which have, they have therefore the absolute power to dominate the body. But as the mind and emotions must have their own food, their own circulation, their own distribution, and their own elimination and excretion. So the vital body has this, and so the physical. The magnetic field, therefore, must clear itself of its own waste. It must, to a degree, support its own nature and the nature of the physical body, and it must form the bridge by means of which the psychic nature communicates with the physical body. For each body or structure that exists, exists not for itself alone, but serves as an instrument between two other bodies, or two other natures. Even as man is not as an instrument complete. For while the human being as a totality has a life of its own, man has also another destiny. That is, he must serve as a mediator between the universe of rational and reasonable principles and the material world in which he lives. <laughs> Therefore, through man, Reason, wisdom, and understanding must be released upon the planet which he inhabits. He is therefore a bridge between an invisible principle and a material world. And energy is the same. Magnetism is a bridge uh, between man's superior nature and, it, and his inferior nature. But this bridge is alive, having a nature, quality, and destiny of its own, although it is at present involved in the composite constitution of man. Thus, the development of magnetic theory of medicine is primarily and must be primarily concerned with the condition, conditioning of the magnetic instrument itself. The body cannot directly connect with this instrument. The body of man cannot, of its own will and purpose, affect the magnetic field. The only way it can influence the magnetic field is through the mental and emotional power, which is superior to body and also superior to electrical energy. Thus we will say that a bad habit of the body 
cannot affect the magnetic field. But the bad habit of the mind, which caused the bad habit of the body, can affect the magnetic field. Because the mental habit is higher and more positive than the magnetism. The mind and the emotions being superior to energy are able to control it. Therefore, any mistake in the psychic life will affect the energy field. But a mistake in the body will not. The only way in which the mistake in the body can affect the magnetic field is by a physical accident or the loss of a member. Actually, the psychological stress, therefore, which depletes man, comes into the body from the mental and emotional life. And these are mental and emotional pressures resulting in bad physical habits it would appear that the physical habit is making the sickness. But it is not the physical habit. It is the psychological attitude causing the habit that is destroying the magnetic balance. Thus, if the individual is angry, and in the course of his anger he has a stroke, we might think at first that this stroke represents the body blocking energy. Such is not the case, however. The body is the victim. The cause of the trouble was the anger that was seated in the mental and emotional life. This prevented uh, the proper function of energy and led to the stroke. Each case, the superior must be responsible for the action of, of inferior. Man as a mental, spiritual, emotional entity is therefore at all times responsible for his own magnetic field and in turn responsible for the action of this field upon his body. And in order to achieve the balance of these factors, he must work from inward control. Now we think of the man controlling energy. This in itself is a kind of a strange term. For while we equally often hear man making rather boastful remarks about what he's going to do with time and space and energy and distance and all these things. Actually, man does not formally control these things inasmuch as they are universal and therefore cannot be actually controlled by anyone. What we call control is merely our own adjustment to them an adjustment to the energies which they contribute to our common economy. When do we therefore say that we can control and direct the uh, magnetic energy? What we mean is that we can either obey or disobey it. We can set certain emotions in process by means of which the natural action of these energies uh, can be revealed or obscured. When we say we will control emotion, what we really mean is that we will control our own misuse of the emotional agent, not to control emotion per se. When we say we will control magnetism, we do not mean that we can actually wave this magic wand and cause magnetism to do anything that it does not want to do. What we are simply meaning is that we are able to make use of this energy by obeying it, by learning its laws and adjusting ourselves to its principles. The same thing um, is the story of the Chinese river. Man living by the side of the Yangtze River depended upon it for many things. This river is like life. He put his uh, water wheel by the side of the river, and it ground his grain for it. He went fishing in the river and got his food. He made boats and sailed upon the river, and thereby it was able to go from one place to another. But at no time does this mean that man controls the river. We might say, yes, but he can build a dam. And in that way, apparently, he does control the river. But his control of the river is not permanent or real. One by one, the dams are broken by the river. And in time, everything that we build to change the course of the river 
will be destroyed by the inevitable force of the water itself. Therefore, our sensible program is always to arrange our water wheels so that we will benefit by the natural law of the river. And control means this. It means nothing more than that we have learned how the river can serve us. If we have not changed the nature of the river or actually controlled it. We have used it. If we use it well, the river serves us. If we break the rules of the water, the river destroys us. The river has swept them away, many of the works of men, even while in another place it was grinding grain for it. So in the energy motions in space, we do not control this energy, but we can variously adapt it to our needs through understanding, through obedience, and through wisdom. We can make ourselves receptive to this energy as we need it. We can come finally to the realization that we must reach in medicine, namely that the universe does want us to be well, and that we will be well when we cease making ourselves sick. The sickness is not actually something that the gods have given man to try his soul. Um, sickness is simply man's inharmonious adjustment with this great magnetic electric field of energy, which is his uh, magnetic nutrition, the nutrition by means of which what he terms his vitality can be maintained. Vitality is not thought, but energy sustains thought. Vitality is not emotion, but energy sustains emotion. Emotion and thought are conditions by which energy is used or abused. But this energy, of course, is of a superior kind to the energy which we commonly term bodily magnetism. But it is also an energy in space. And all levels of existence, from the spirit to the body, all levels are sustained by an energy on their own level. And the structural forms that exist in those levels are sustained by their energies just as the Earth is sustained by the combination of the lunar or humid and solar or germinal principles. Thus as the light and the rain cause all things to grow, so these represent the basic energies necessary for physical development. And each plane has its light and its humidity. And this light humidity has been referred to as the electric magnetic field. These combining make all of the forms growing on their own levels fruitful, cause them to germinate and to come forth into manifestation. Thoughts are born this way, emotions are born this way, bodies are born. And it is the duty of the individual to try to understand these energies and forces so that he can use them wisely and develop from them a new and adequate concept of therapy. As we said, the gradual depletion of our world's energies will make it ultimately necessary for man to search in space for nutrition. And this space nutrition is available. And gradually he can supplant uh, the sources of energy around him by direct appeal to the solar energy, uh, to the fragmented lunar energy, which reaches him on a different polarity. He can gradually weave out of the energy substances everything that he needs. For actually matter is only a kind of drop that falls out of energy, squeezed out of it, in the process of natural unfoldment. Bodies are therefore primarily merely masses of minerals, sustained, held together, made animate by energy, and that by having become energized, they are ensouled by powers needing this energized form for the expression of still superior powers and talents. So the body becomes the instrument 
and magnetism is the fuel. And man as soul and mind rides in this instrument or vehicle. Just as surely as your combustion motor releases certain forms of energy, so the combustion process of energy is present everywhere in the structure of living things. Some persons are born with the ability to communicate magnetic energy. Others probably can attain the skill to do this. Instruments can be devised, and it is possible, again, to create a synthetic. It is possible for man to create, by his knowledge of electricity and electronics in general, a synthetic instrument for the production of the magnetic energies necessary for life. But the question is going to be, what will be missing in the synthetic? This can be very, very important, because that which is generally missing is the subtle part. And the subtle part is that which is least evident and most important. Now, in the concept of the creation of a magnetic field by artificial means, a biosynthetic, what might be the element most likely to be missing? That which is the most abstract and abstruse, namely the element by means of which mind, emotion, consciousness are able to ensoul the magnetic field. That the magnetic field could be produced to the degree that it would sustain the body is not inconceivable, but that it would at the same time constitute the bridge between consciousness and body might be the problem that would face all synthetics in the field of electrical chemistry. The difficulty in finding out the nature of this link. If such a condition should arise, we might then gradually find that man's relationship to body would be slowly broken. Not immediately, probably, because his own natural energies would sustain it for a considerable time. But in the course of 500 or 1,000 or 10,000 years, if man became continually dependent upon a synthetic and no longer was able to provide the natural elements of the compound, the link between body and consciousness could slowly be broken, which would mean that the body would no longer be a suitable instrument for consciousness. While this is occurring, however, we would probably develop a whole new group of ailments, very serious ones, and which would be simply telling us that we were breaking a rule, and breaking a very serious rule. In the last 25 years, we have developed a whole sequence of ailments which were comparatively little known, or not nearly so strenuous in the past as they have become in more recent years. In spite of all of our advance in science, we're not becoming healthier. The reason why is that we are achieving a synthetic progress, a progress in which our advancements are not complete, not balanced. And with all our progress, we are not assuring man of the controlling power of his own consciousness over his magnetic and material body. Medicine can force the body into certain situations, temporarily alleviating symptoms. Various forms of uh, specialized nutri nutritional elements can temporarily stimulate the magnetic field. But unless these processes are in exact harmony with nature, Unless, finally, all science becomes the handmaiden of nature, unless every process is an exact and identical replica of total nature, we cannot be sure of the result. Because nature is a very wonderful and mysterious compound of circumstances. And man is a product of the involving processes of countless laws, many of which he knows nothing about. Consequently, it is always dangerous as man's various developments cause him to move away from nature 
it is always dangerous because it removes him from the harmony of the relationship of magnetic nutrition and physical nutrition. He can bluff his way to the maintenance of his physical existence, but he cannot bluff his magnetic field. He knows no way of influencing it, no way of changing its force, no way of commanding it to obey him, and he has developed as yet no synthetic which will supply it with the energies which it requires. Therefore, if he breaks its rules, he is bound to find an increasing pattern of physical discomfort and disorder. This usually precedes discovery, for man becoming gradually aware that he is making a mistake begins to concern himself with finding out what's wrong. And it is very well possible with the direct thinking that we have today that in a few years we will begin the research of this mathematic equation. In fact, in a way it is already being done, but that the work shall spread it is not at all unlikely, and that ultimately we shall realize that this is the next step in the vast unfoldment of the problem of nutrition, which will be forced upon us by the problems that we are now facing, and still more so by the population problem that lies ahead. We must solve the problem of how we are sustained as living creatures. And to solve that problem, we must analyze and understand the principle of magnetic nutrition. When we understand that, we will be much safer than we are today. In the meantime, not being in full possession of the fact, the one thing always to remember is, when you want to help the magnetic field to function best, relax. Try to prevent false tensions from exhausting energy and make yourself receptive to life. This you can often do and find it brings a quick relief from special fatigue. In fact, that is one of the secrets of sleep, but it is also involved a man being able to live every day in a relaxed rather than a tense space. Tension locks the, the field from the physical body. Relaxation opens the context, the context and helps us to live in a more healthy way. Well, time is up, so it's now all time to go home and relax. <laughs>